Hi guys, it's Michelle and today's video is going to be another pop culture conspiracy theories video for you guys. I love pop culture, as you know. Um, I just think it's the most interesting and fun thing to talk about. God forbid, sorry, I like celebrities. I do. Um, and I do feel like they always have a lot of conspiracies around them. So let's get into it. All right, the first conspiracy I wanna talk about has to do with the connection between Nipsey and Left Eye Lopez's death. And I never thought that these two cases were related, but it's actually really freaking scary. So both of these people's cases revolve around a man named Dr. Sebi, who is an alternative healer who claimed that he could cure diseases like AIDS and cancer through natural remedies. Now, the reason that Dr. Dr. Sebi is important in both of these things is because both Lisa and Nipsey were making documentaries on Dr. Sebi at the time of their deaths and their deaths were years apart. So Lisa, better known as Left Eye Lopez from the band TLC, was a well-known supporter of Dr. Sebi's work. In the months leading up to her death in April of 2002, she spent a lot of time in Honduras, which is where Dr. Sebi had his healing village. And basically she was there to embark kind of on a spiritual journey and she was filming a documentary. The documentary was meant to be like about her life and about Dr. Sebi's practices and just like healing with him. But because she died, this documentary was kind of turned into like, oh, the last days of Left Eye Lopez. Like it was very much the whole Dr. Sebi narrative got like kind of swept under the rug. Lisa died in a car accident and she did have weird feelings about that she was going to die leading up to her death. Um, there was a weird thing where she was involved with an accident a couple weeks prior with a little boy who was named Lopez, like that was his last name as well. And he unfortunately died in the accident, but she was freaking out because she was saying like the Grim Reaper meant to take her. She's like death meant to come for me and mistake that took that little boy. His name is Lopez as well. Like, I don't know, the days leading up to her death, she did just feel like something was off. So I will say that. Now, fast forward to 2019, Nipsey Hussle, who was a Grammy nominated rapper and a community activist and was also connected to Dr. Sebi. Apparently he had announced his plans for a documentary that would basically explore Dr. Sebi's life, his legal battles, and his claims about being able to cure AIDS. Nipsey has also said in several interviews that he was warned to be cautious about talking about this documentary and working on this documentary because some people suggested to him that that would make him a target. On March 31st of 2019, Nipsey was shot and killed outside of his marathon clothing store in Los Angeles. Angeles. Officially, it's a solved case. Uh, the shooter was a man named Eric Holder, and apparently they had a personal dispute. But a lot of conspiracy theorists believe that this man was hired to kill Nipsey because of his involvement with Dr. Sebi and the documentary that he was going to release. So I do personally feel like these two things are too, like, intertwined to ignore. I don't know how I've never heard of this theory before because we've talked about separately the deaths of Nipsey and the death of Left Eye Lopez. But with Left Eye, it was more just that it was strange that she felt like she knew she was going to die. So we kind of talked about it in that way. But to have this conspiracy behind it makes so much sense and it's really scary. A lot of people think it has to do with the medical industry and the fact that there could be alternative healing methods for major diseases like AIDS and cancer that the government or like the big pharma whatever doesn't want you to know about because essentially that would rip away a shit ton of money from what they're making on chemotherapy and basically like just different um cures for diseases but it's not really a cure it's more of a treatment that's like not really making the person better but keeping them alive so that they can keep spending money and it's kind of fucked like actually really fucked up like very sick not to mention the fact that dr sebi also is dead he himself died while he was in police custody under suspicious circumstances. So we have quite a few questions about that. After Nipsey's death, Nick Cannon actually vowed to continue the Dr. Sebi documentary in his honor. I've seen like bits and pieces about this, but I cannot find for anything. I can't find if he ever actually made this documentary. Like, I don't think the documentary ever really got made. He released a trailer for it like four years ago but I'm not seeing the documentary unless it got like erased from something. I don't know. 
I don't, I don't know, but I will say, like, I think that I wouldn't really blame Nick Cannon for not wanting to do this documentary because his friend quite literally probably got killed because he wanted to talk about it, which is horrible. I mean, to be honest, if this is true, that can only mean one thing, which is that Dr. Sebi was obviously on to something and correct about some of his healing practices. And it is, sucks so bad that the government slash big pharma, whatever the pharmaceutical industry is so corrupt and selfish that instead of helping people curing them, they care more about money than they care about your life. And that's so fucking hard to like sit with, you know? Like, and that's just disgusting. I wanna hear your thoughts on this. I mean, I think it's a well-known conspiracy theory, but I'm surprised no one has ever asked me to talk about it because I get asked to talk about a lot of different theories. And I don't know if it's like that talked about or known. So I would like to hear your guys' thoughts on this because I think that that's like really scary shit. All right, the next couple of theories kind of coincide with what's going on with P. Diddy. I did an entire video on him if you guys want to check it out. But I want to talk about his ex, Kim Porter. So Kim Porter was the mother of P. Diddy's children and recently... There's been reports of a tell-all book that has come out that she was allegedly writing when she died. So the book is called Kim's Lost Words, A Journey for Justice from the Other Side. And essentially the man who released it claims that he got the book on a hard drive from a source that was close to both Diddy and Kim Porter. And a lot of people think that that's Kimora Lee Simmons, but we'll talk about that later. So I want to definitely say that a lot of people do not think that this is Kim Porter's work. Like people don't believe that she wrote it. Personally, the way that I feel like it checks out to like what we know, I don't know. So let's just get into some of the things that she said in the book. We'll talk first about Kim and Diddy's relationship. So obviously we know now that Diddy is an abusive person and partner. We saw him abuse Cassie Ventura quite horrifically on camera which is insane like the fact that he was doing that in a hotel is absolutely nuts because what do you do behind closed doors it's just horrifying but this book alleges that kim and p diddy also had a abusive toxic relationship so this one story in particular anytime i say like i'm talking about this book it's all alleged that kim wrote it just want to make that clear so Kim said basically she got into a disagreement with P. Diddy because a producer had sent her flowers or something like literally again completely not her fault and she wrote about it saying quote I couldn't believe the man I loved could flip so quickly it hit me so hard that the room spun I knew that he was dangerous but leaving wasn't an option he told me I'd never be anything without him I was trapped it was like living in a gilded cage and no one was coming to help and that was allegedly after she was hit with a chair by P. Diddy because um a producer like sent her flowers which is just disgusting. So it's a pretty big conspiracy theory that we've talked about quite a few times at this point that people believe that P. Diddy was involved with Tupac Shakur's murder. I think that this makes a lot of sense, but what surprised me is a lot of people think Diddy was also involved with Biggie's murder, which is surprising because they were very close friends. But nonetheless, Kim Porter's tell-all alleged book kind of went into the theories about Tupac and Biggie. She said, quote, after Pac was gone, I could feel tension in the air. He started getting paranoid, kept looking over his shoulder like he was next, but he never wanted to talk about it. That's business, he'd say. And then about Biggie, she claims that basically what had happened was Tupac died then a lot of people knew Biggie was next. A lot of people were aware in the industry. A lot of people wanted him dead. And the theory goes, while Diddy didn't actually send the hit on Biggie, he knew it was going to happen. And instead of like protecting him, like basically handed him over to the person who killed him. One quote that stands out to me is, I asked him once, did you know about Big's death before it happened? He didn't answer. He just stared at me like I wasn't supposed to ask those questions. And again, I think this checks out a lot because one of P. Diddy's bodyguards, Gene Deal, has claimed and been claiming for years that Puff knew that Biggie was going to get killed that night because there was something with, um, I'll insert the clip, but there was something with the tires of the car and how it was like marked and known 
that Biggie was in that vehicle. Who idea was it for Biggie to lead a vibe party in an SUV with the Life Out the Dust stickers on the hubcaps? I don't know if Big came over to Andre Harrell with that on his car, but Puff didn't have it on his car. You understand that? So only one that has an opportunity and only one that could have done that was somebody from the street team. Do you understand that? And they are put up to do certain things. So somebody was put up to do that because they didn't put it on Puff Car. It was somebody in our crew that wanted them to know that Big was in that vehicle because somebody wanted to know, yo, if y'all going to get Big, he go to the car with the stickers on it. Because you got to understand this, man. Puff and Big wasn't as close as you would think they were. Somebody was told to put those stickers on the car. They wouldn't have done it. Don't nobody do nothing unless they was told to do it. To, 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 to put those stickers on the car, on the wheels, and the other car didn't have it on it? It don't make sense, bro. And those cars was rented. So to put those stickers on there, you defacing the property. You understand? Somebody got to pay for that. So my whole thing about it is, is that it was somebody in our crew that wanted them to know that Big was in that vehicle. So obviously that's kind of suspicious. So now I kind of agree. I do think that maybe while Diddy didn't actually have the hit on Biggie Smalls, I think that perhaps Suge Knight did just as we had previously suspected, but I think Diddy knew about it and could have prevented it, but didn't. And that's pretty fucked up because that is like one of his best friends and also his biggest client. So that's just insane. But again, he's worth more to him in death than he was in life. And that's horrible, but it's true. One of the biggest conspiracies, I guess, that came from this Kim Porter tell all book was that she had allegedly found basically tapes and footage of Diddy in compromising illegal positions in regards to his freak offs and just being like with underage people, like, R wording people, S saying people, all that stuff. And she wrote, quote, I found the tapes. I wasn't supposed to, but I did. There were things on there, things that could destroy him. I knew my life was in danger after that. And then Kim Porter allegedly made copies of these tapes, suspecting that Diddy might harm her if he ever found out that she had them. But in the book, Kim talks about how she confronted Diddy and said like, I know. Like I've seen the tapes. I know that they exist, but I don't think that she let him know that she had copies. But allegedly he assumed that because according to a lot of Kim's friends, regardless of this book or not, people said that Kim claimed that she was scared of Diddy in the like months leading up to her death. She was very concerned. She said like, if anything happens to me, you have to investigate Puff because there is something wrong here. And I think that that's really scary and important because according to the last passage, basically Kim Porter had died of pneumonia in 2018. And the last passage of her book says, I don't know what's happening to me. I feel weak. I feel like I'm being watched. I think I need to go to the hospital, but I'm scared. I think he knows. And then allegedly Kim Porter died after that. And that was the last alleged passage that she had wrote in her alleged tell all book. I don't know if the book is real or not, but I will say I do think that there is a hundred thousand percent something dark going on here because first of all, even if those weren't her last words, after she died, her house was broken into and laptops were stolen. Like obviously Diddy must have believed that those were the copies of him doing his illegal shit. And I don't know, I kind of just think that it checks out and I do think that he was involved, allegedly. But let me know your guys' thoughts. I, I don't know, do you think the book's real or not? Like a lot of people are saying, oh, her kids are saying they're not. I'm like, you're forgetting. Her kids are also his kids. Like if you're told something, by your parent like the person that you're supposed to believe you're probably going to believe them like i don't know it's kind of the same sense like nicole brown simpson's kids never believed that oj like their father killed nicole brown simpson but obviously a lot of people disagree with that so i don't know 
I don't know. Kim also spoke a little bit about Justin Bieber as well, and this is what she had to say. Some of the tapes had things I would have never expected. The gay parties are young thing, but the are one thing, but the young boys, like Usher, Little Bow Wow, and Justin Bieber. Oh my God! Allegedly, again. But I truly think that Justin Bieber is somebody who is potentially groomed. Actually, I would say definitely groomed by the industry in some sense of the word. Like he was very much involved with things as a child that he should not have been exposed to. And a lot of people think the yummy music video, which is our next conspiracy theory, it has to do with sending a cryptic message about child trafficking in I've really never understood his promotion or the music video for this song because his promotion was weird as hell. He kept sharing a series of pictures of babies on his Instagram with the hashtag yummy, which is just strange given the context of the song. I do think there is something up with this, but I would like to hear guys' thoughts. I do think people have always thought this music video was weird and that the promotion was weird, but now with all of the P Diddy stuff coming out and talking about how just Justin was potentially thrown into the Hollywood industry way too much by not only Diddy but Usher and potentially like groomed by them as well. I think that this theory has really spiraled from there but there is something cryptic and strange about this particular song release and music video. I've never understood it but again a lot of conspiracy theorists believe that it's a coded message about child exploitation in Hollywood but let me know your thoughts. All right, the next theories we're gonna talk about have to do with Sabrina Carpenter. Sabrina Carpenter is quite literally the it girl. She is Miss Girl right now. And a lot of people have been talking about the conspiracy theory that Tom Cruise wants Sabrina Carpenter to be the new celebrity face of Scientology. So Scientology is quite literally <laughs> like a cult. I don't like to say it, but like, just listen to what Leah Remini has to say about it. She was a Scientologist. But it low-key, high-key scares me. Like, that shit is scary to me, and I don't like it. But nonetheless, I know they really enjoy having celebrity endorsements, which I also think is kind of strange. So you might be wondering, why, why Sabrina Carpenter? Why would she be a part of the Scientology people? Well, her aunt, Nancy Cartwright, is. Her aunt is Nancy Cartwright, who is famous for voicing Bart Simpson on The Simpsons, and she has been a very prominent Scientologist for decades. Nancy Cartwright has donated over $21 million to the Church of Scientology over the years, and she even has like a prestigious title there called the Patron Excalibur. Like, literally, what? And she has been like known as a key figure in the church for decades. So because she is the aunt of Sabrina Carpenter, a lot of people have started to speculate whether or not Sabrina will be the new face of Scientology. Personally, I don't think so, but do I think that they want her to? Absolutely. I don't really think that Sabrina is a Scientologist. I don't know if she was raised in the church at all or like what the tea is, but I don't think that she is a one now but uh, then again because i was gonna say she's just like doing her thing but at the same time tom cruise like besides him talking about scientology before he ever spoke about it i would have never known he was a scientologist you kind of just don't know i actually didn't even know nancy cartwright was but it's definitely really odd and a lot of people really really believe that tom cruise is trying to get sabrina on that celebrity scientology roster and i totally believe that part like what well, i don't believe she'll do it but i do believe that he is trying to get her to because why wouldn't he they're obsessed with having celebrities be the face of the church i don't know why i honestly think it has to do with the concept of wanting to make everyone feel like safer about the church because we obviously have questions of whether or not it's a cult we have questions on where the fuck is shelly miscavige like there's a lot of questions and strangeness revolving around scientology and so i think having like a familiar face be up there and being like, no, yeah, Scientology is all good. Like, love it. Makes people, like, theoretically would make people feel better, but I think now we're just, like, kind of caught on to their shit at this point, especially with, like, Leah Remini coming out and talking against the church. Honestly, I kind of want to make a whole video on it, but they kind of scare me. So if you want it, let me know. <laughs> but do you think that Tom Cruise is trying to recruit Sabrina Carpenter? Personally, I believe it, and I wonder if she's ever been involved in the church, and I don't know. 
I'm curious. I'm very, very curious about this, and I'm curious to see where it goes. I would be so upset if she, like, started endorsing the Church of Scientology, but I just, like, can't picture that for her, but stranger things have happened. I don't know. Speaking of Sabrina Carpenter, I want to talk about this theory. I have, like, talked about this, but I want to reiterate it, that I truly believe that the reason that Sabrina Carpenter is as famous as she is now is because Taylor Swift wanted her to be. And we need to talk about this again because this is bothering me. One, two, I did have some inside information that's maybe pointing that this theory could be somewhat accurate. So I 100,000% think that there is something up between Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo. This is kind of a thing for a very long time. At first, everything was chill in 2021. Driver's license came out. Olivia liked, loved Taylor Swift growing up her entire life. She always was a huge Swifty. And Taylor Swift really seemed to take Olivia under her wing. Uh, and then in May of 2021, Taylor and Olivia met for the first time. And it seemed like they were going to have like a great little cute friendship, like mentor situation. Because obviously Olivia is significantly younger. So then Olivia gets a call from Taylor Swift's little team and basically says that they want writing credits on Deja Vu because they believe it's inspired by Cruel Summer. This has legit never made sense to me. I don't think the two songs sound alike whatsoever to deserve writing credits is kind of insane in my opinion. And for Taylor Swift to like actively want to do that is just weird in my book. Um, but ever since that happened, the vibes between Taylor and Olivia have just been really off. And Olivia has not really directly talked about it, but she has said, quote, I think it's disappointing to see people take things out of context and discredit any young woman's work. But at the end of the day, I'm just really proud and happy to say that my job is being a songwriter. All music is inspired by each other. I obviously write all of my lyrics from my heart and my life first. I came up with the lyrics and melody for Good For You one morning in the shower. So yes, I like, was she talking about this Taylor Swift, Cruel Summer, Deja Vu situation? I think so, but that's up for interpretation. Now, at this point, ever since then, I have felt eerie about Taylor Swift. I will say I love Taylor Swift. Like, do not get me wrong. I was supposed to go to the Eras tour in Vienna. I literally was, I literally went to Austria and uh, yeah, if you know, you know, that one got a little canceled, but either way, I have always loved Taylor Swift. I've always loved Olivia Rodrigo and I love Sabrina Carpenter. Those are like three of my girls, probably three of my top artists, honestly, on Spotify. But what I will say is something gives me the ick about Taylor Swift going after such a young girl like Olivia Rodrigo to discredit her and like want co-writing credits on deja vu like i that doesn't sit right with me because that's not just like taylor's team or like a copyright issue like that's the songs are completely fucking different the fact that she has co-writing credits is preposterous to me like that does not make any sense and it sucks because it makes me believe the whole theory that taylor swift is low-key a mean girl and I kind of think that this is true, unfortunately. And I feel like her relationship with Sabrina Carpenter is literally proving that. Honestly, genuinely, truly, what I think happened is I think Taylor Swift got jealous that another young girl was coming up and she was like, not similar to Taylor Swift, but kind of had like a similar like songwriting style vibe, like very sweet, emotional, like music, breakups, like all that stuff was getting popular and she wanted to take her down. I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent true, but I will say like, that's the vibe it's giving. That is what it's giving. And it gives, and it grosses me out because like Olivia was such a young girl at this time. And she has been quoted saying to Rolling Stone, there was a lot of bullying and a lot of jealousy and a lot of people whom I adored my whole life being mean girls. And a lot of people speculate that that is about Taylor Swift. And I will say, I will say, I just think it checks out. Like I, like the fucking credits are there. You can look up Deja Vu, Taylor Swift has credits on that song. And she didn't always have writing credits, which means that she quite literally definitely had her team 
ask for those credits and I just think that's weird I just think she moves weird I don't know and now her being best friends with Sabrina Carpenter who Olivia Rodrigo like kind of publicly feuded with because because Sabrina is the blonde girl that Olivia was talking about that started dating Joshua Bassett kind of oh maybe there was an overlap I don't know I don't actually think there was but like I guess Joshua Bassett moved on really quickly to Sabrina Carpenter um, and broke Olivia Rodrigo's heart. And I just think that Taylor Swift is moving kind of weird because the whole Cruel Summer thing happens. She starts like not really like supporting Olivia's music and vice versa. And then all of a sudden she has like her known enemy, I guess. And not that I think Sabrina and Olivia are actually enemies. Don't get me wrong. But she has her known like, you know, op on her Eras tour. And granted that made Sabrina Carpenter a lot more famous and I think honestly kind of bites Taylor in the ass anyway because if Taylor Swift really wanted Olivia Rodrigo to like fail I guess and she didn't want her to be like a popular singer because she felt like she was too similar to Taylor Swift I feel like she literally turned Sabrina Carpenter into a pop star like kind of overnight and I just feel like that might bite her in the ass at some point because Sabrina might become more famous than Taylor Swift. I don't really know if I think that'll ever happen. I don't know if it's even possible to become more famous than Taylor Swift. But I do think that this shit is interesting. I just think, I think it's an interesting theory. I think that there is some truth to it. Usually where there's smoke, there's fire, I will say. And I don't like how it makes me feel about Taylor Swift. I have to say, like, ever since thinking of this theory and, like, thinking about how it all connects with Olivia and Sabrina and Taylor and like seeing the way that Taylor moved through a couple of these things because regardless factual she did do the cruel summer versus deja vu thing that's she did she did that and seeing her move like that I don't know I, like I can't look at her in the same way which sucks because I loved Taylor Swift but I also understand Taylor Swift was brought up in this industry. She was like 13 years old when she started being famous. Like, of course, she's gonna like move the way a lot of big producers and people move. And I just, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't like it because it sucks. Cause Olivia seems so sweet, like just like the sweetest girl ever. And it makes me really upset to see, honestly, because, because first of all, all of this drama was over a fucking boy at the end of the day. And it was Joshua Bassett. <laughs> Like, I can't. Oh, well, at least the Sabrina versus Olivia thing. Because otherwise, I don't know. I want Sabrina and Olivia to collab. I have faith, sort of, that Sabrina will come through and be like a girl's girl to Olivia. But I don't know. A lot of people think that she might be a mean girl too. What do you fucking think? Is it just because they're blonde? Like, sometimes I do think that blondes are seen as meaner. But sometimes it's because maybe they are. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this. And I want to hear if it made you look at Taylor Swift differently. And it made you look at this whole situation as differently. Like, it makes me want to take Olivia Rodrigo and give her a hug. Because I would be devastated if one of my favorite artists, if I became famous, if I became a famous singer and fucking Ariana Grande did that shit to me. Girl. I would lose my fucking marbles. I would be so sad. And that just makes me want to hug Olivia Rodrigo and be like, girl, it's okay. Like, that's shitty. Because regardless, Cruel Summer and Deja Vu do not sound anything alike. I do not. I like actually every time I talk about this, I have to go listen to it again. And I'm just like, where, where's the similarity? Where is it? Because I can't hear it. Anyway, this video is getting long. So that is it for today's video. If you guys liked it, please give it a big thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think of all of these different pop culture theories. But that is it. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And subscribe for new videos every week. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.